late 11th century. During the winter of his discontent, an excommunicated king makes a hazardous crossing through Montsenis, the last alpine pass available to him. Though he walks in the footsteps of Charlemagne, this would-be emperor comes not to conquer, but to repent. He has no great army, only a small entourage consisting of a steadfast wife, a toddling son, and the last friends and followers remaining to him, both in this world and perhaps the next. Reverting to all fours, this fellowship of the damned clambers up the so-called Mountain of Ashes, and a cow hide is given to the women so they can glide down the other side. When at last this fellowship's dolorous road brings them to Canosa, a frigid reception awaits them before the castle gates. Though a blizzard approaches, the Pope and the Countess within the stronghold refuse to grant these sorry pilgrims entry. Yet the monarch takes this to be his final trial, and he waits outside the gates for three days and three nights on end, braving the elements barefooted with only a woolen sackcloth wrapped around his quivering frame. Neither the lashing winds nor the heavy snows drowned out his plaintive tears and prayers, and on the fourth day, the gates of the castle finally swung open for the king and his apostles. The story of Henry IV's showdown with Pope Gregory VII is as dramatic as it is consequential. Since that watershed winter of 1077 AD, the name of the sleepy Italian village has become synonymous with a highly politicized form of humiliation ritual. Almost a millennium later, Bismarck invoked the incident during his own chess match with the papacy, and in the century that followed, a British diplomat exclaimed that Chamberlain's trip to Nazi Germany was like Henry IV going to Canossa all over again. By that point, the golden age of the papacy had long since passed. The Pope, Stalin asked, how many divisions has he got? Henry IV might have asked a similar question at the dawn of the High Middle Ages. And therein lies the story's central mystery. How is it that the preeminent monarch of Europe had no recourse but to humble himself before a pope? And what exactly did this act of penance mean for him and his successors? Was it truly the humiliating defeat everyone regards it as, or was it simply the best move on the chessboard? To answer these questions and some others in the process, we will need to take a longer route to Canossa, going back over half a century to 1024 AD the year that Henry IV's grandfather was elected King of Germany. But first, a word from our sponsor, World of Warships, a free-to-play naval strategy game. Join the fun and commemorate the heroes of Normandy with a special event dedicated to the 80th anniversary of the Day of Days. Engage in epic naval warfare, command legendary new vessels, strategize in preparation for new missions, and dominate the waves in thrilling battles inspired by the events of June 6, 1944. You can look forward to new content like this every single month, whether it's new ships, nations, classes, or cosmetics. And did I mention that World of Warships is available on consoles in addition to PCs? Download the game today using my link in the video description, and use my promo code DDAY80 to get 7 days of premium account time as well as 1 million credits, 200 doubloons, a free ship after you complete 15 battles, and three special D-Day missions after nine battles. And now, back to the video. With the death of the last Ottonian emperor, Henry II, the great German magnates assembled near the town of Oppenheim to elect a new ruler. It is a testament to Otto the Great's family that though their mainline perished, there was no question that the German realm should remain intact. The two contenders for the royal throne were cousins of Franconian origin, and curiously, they shared the same name. One was called Conrad the Elder, the other Conrad the Younger. And through their namesake, Conrad the Red, their illustrious ancestry also included Otto the Great. Over the next century, these genealogical roots assumed a life of their own, burrowing deeper and deeper in the soil of time, through the Saline Laco to the Saline Franks through the Merovingians to the immemorial city of Troy. That is why this family has come to be known as the Salians, four of whom were crowned kings of Germany and Holy Roman emperors. So which Conrad was the first in this succession? Would it be the older cousin or the younger one that took the kingship and with it the first steps toward Canossa? Feeling the weight of history on his brawny shoulders, 
the older Conrad decided to pull his cousin aside for a little heart-to-heart, -heart, shocking anyone who might have overheard him. My cousin, since we have been found worthy of consideration for such a high honor, we must take care that we do not dishonor this favor through a family quarrel. The collective desire, will, and consent of Franks, Lotharingians, Saxons, Bavarians, and Swabians combined to favor us, the shoots of one root, of one house, of one indissoluble domestic community. If I sense that the spirit of the people wants you, that it desires you as their king and lord, by no perversity will I divert this good from you. If, however, God should favor me, I have no doubt that you will be equally obliging on my behalf." At that, the two cousins embraced, a clear signal to the magnates to proceed with the election. The primate of Germany, the foremost clerical authority north of the Alps, cast the first vote setting an important precedent for future elections. Soon, an almost unanimous consensus was reached, and the 30-something Conrad the Elder emerged as the next king of Germany. His election prospects had been aided by a couple of different factors. For one, he was strikingly tall, and not just for that era. Clocking in at nearly 6 foot 7 inches, or 2 whole meters, his height surpassed even that of Charlemagne nor was it exaggerated in the manner of his ancestry, something we know for a fact because in the year 1900, Conrad's mummified corpse was dug up, his 6 foot 7 inch frame found completely intact. One has to pity Conrad's horses, and not just because of his height, but because he was known for his ability to ride almost 100 miles, or 150 kilometers, in a single day. In addition to all of that, this force of nature already had a son to secure the succession, Conrad the Younger could say nothing of the sort, and he ultimately died childless, a footnote in his towering cousin's story. On the way to his royal coronation, Conrad the Elder was unexpectedly delayed by the petitions of a peasant, an orphan, and a widow. It was an early test to see what sort of king he would be, and Conrad's primary chronicler dotingly notes that he behaved like a vicar of Christ. At other times, the annals were less reverent, referring to the new king as idiota, meaning layman or illiterate. But though he could not read or write, Conrad knew well how to rule. To inaugurate his reign, he toured the German realm at breakneck speed, and all the while it was said that Charlemagne's stirrups hung from his saddle. As had been the case under the Carolingians and Ottonians, the Salian court was highly mobile, numbering some three to 4,000 retainers at a time when the court of Constantinople counted to roughly half that number. A full fifth of Conrad's trips took him to Saxony, where he pacified the fitful homeland of his Ottonian predecessors through the power of personal presence. But a show of force didn't always cut it. Often, force itself was required. Following his stepson's second rebellion, Conrad had him clapped in irons and upon his death, quipped that rabid dogs rarely produce offspring. Not long after that, his dead stepson's lands and titles were transferred to his trueborn son, and this process was repeated elsewhere. Conrad would ultimately leave his sole son and heir, Henry, with the duchies of Bavaria, Swabia, and Carinthia, setting the Salian dynasty up on firm royal foundations. Yet Conrad aimed higher. His aspirations were decidedly imperial, both in scope and in essence. In 1027, he crossed the Alps and arrived in the Eternal City, where, with the Pope's blessing, he assumed the imperial dignity before an audience of blue-blooded royals, nobles, and clerics. The tide even dragged Canute the Great in, and this king of a united England, Denmark, and Norway became fast friends with his German neighbor. Though his daughter, Gunhilda, was not the purple-born bride that Conrad hoped to secure for his son, she was still a worthy match. Unfortunately, the sons and daughters of Rome were less impressed with their new emperor, organizing themselves into a riotous mob that was forced to disperse and walk barefoot through the city, an ominous sign of things to come. In the ensuing decade, Conrad would be compelled to return to Italy in order to address the Valvasores revolt, the Valvasores being sub-vassals to the Capitane, or captains, who were themselves sub-vassals to the bishops and archbishops of Italy. Unlike the Capitane, the Valvasores did not hold land by hereditary right, but by clerical appointment, which is what led to the revolt in the first place. Both sides asked the emperor to intervene, and though he could not know it, 
His decision to side with the Valvasores against the church was the first step in the long road to Canosa. This giant of German history bequeathed to his successors at least two more legacies worth discussing. The first was joining Burgundy to the Holy Roman Empire, a military feat undertaken during one of the coldest winters in recent history. During the night, the horses became immobilized and they could not be dragged away from the ground frozen around them, except with axes and stakes. One man, however, who had no help, killed his own horse and pulled the hide away from the shanks upward. The rest he left fixed to the frozen earth. Indeed, because of this cold, men were often confused one with another, for the young and old looked alike. Day and night, all were hoary and bearded because of the horrid rigor of the ice. To justify the occupation of this long independent border state, Conrad asserted that he had inherited the dynastic claims of his Atonian predecessor, a line of argument he had used before, when he famously told a Pavian delegation that they had no right to secede from the empire or to destroy imperial property. Even if the king had died, the kingdom remained, just as the ship remains whose steerman falls. They were state, not private buildings. They were under another law, not yours. This argument was at once modern and imperialistic, amounting to no less than the declaration of a transpersonal monarchy, one that withstood the comings and goings of individual rulers and dynasties. Yet the finest legacy of the first sailing emperor, the legacy sealed in stone, is undoubtedly the foundation of Speyer Cathedral. Construction began at the start of Conrad's reign, and today the church is the biggest Romanesque structure in the world, a worthy tribute to such a big personality. Though it would only be consecrated by his son and expanded by his grandson, enough progress had taken place by the time of Conrad's death for the cathedral to serve as his burial site. In 1039 AD, this born booze-bloated monarch was finally laid to rest after a protracted battle with gout, and as per tradition, his discolored innards were taken to Utrecht for safekeeping. It would be said by Conrad's chronicler that while one emperor performed a salutary incision upon the body politique, the other in his wisdom restored the Roman Empire to its health. This other empire builder was of course Conrad's son and heir, the 20-something Henry III. Not since the ascent of Otto the Great Son had the realm experienced a more unproblematic succession. Charlemagne's son, Louis the Pious, was similarly fortunate, and Henry could trace his heritage back to both of these founding dynasties, the Ottonians through his father and the Carolingians through his mother. In many ways, Henry III represented a return to normalcy. He gave away the duchies of Swabia, Corinthia, and Franconia, and accepted the long-running trend toward ducal heredity. He took a close interest in the former Ottonian power base of Saxony, expanding the city of Gosler and exploiting the silver deposits of the Harz Mountains. Most importantly, Henry resumed the comfortable alliance between church and state, following its lapse during the Valvasores revolt. Like his Ottonian namesake, Henry III demonstrated a genuine and sincere piety, and it was during his reign that the sacral German kingship attained its most perfect form. This immediately becomes clear based on how frequently the sources equate him with the biblical King David then regarded as the ideal monarch and a prefiguration of Christ himself. That made Henry his postfiguration, a role he readily embraced. The second salient emperor attended to each of his sacral duties, well, religiously. He corrected his bishops when they got their Latin wrong and refused to have musicians perform at his wedding, not wanting to trivialize such a solemn occasion. He repeatedly wore a sackcloth so as to be pardoned for his severity and even asked to be forgiven for spilling the blood of his enemies in battle. Like his predecessors, Henry oversaw church assemblies called synods, where he freely made and unmade pontiffs, among them a certain Victor II, the last German pope until Benedict XVI. At one of these synods, however, Henry did something truly unprecedented, declaring a peace such as had not been seen in many centuries. This was nothing less than a full-throated attempt to pacify the empire, the culmination of a long-running sacral agenda. Henry III has since been hailed as the last effective representative of a ruler of the Christian empire. 
Yet his reign was also a representation of the ironclad law of unintended consequences. With the second Salian Emperor's blessing, the papacy initiated a much needed rehabilitation program. The process lasted from around 1046 to 1076 AD, the same year the third Salian Emperor set off to Canossa. In that span of time, the popes in Rome gradually accumulated enough legitimacy to turn themselves into the undisputed leaders of Western Christendom. This was largely achieved through the Gregorian reforms, a systematic and spirited detox of the church's sins, namely simony and priestly marriages. Reformers pointed to the inherent immorality of buying and selling ecclesiastical offices, and argued that a priest's only bride should be the Virgin Mary. Incidentally, the topic of priestly marriages was to be one of the sticking points in the Great Schism of 1054, when the churches of East and West finally split along the fault lines of iconoclasm, Charlemagne's coronation, and Henry II's semantical fixation on the filioque clause. The very mechanics of this schism, mutual excommunication by the patriarchs of Rome and Constantinople, signaled the advent of a weapon that the medieval papacy would wield like an ICBM. And though the Cold War between Pope and Emperor did not begin until Henry IV assumed power, already the dominoes were falling into place. Around this time, the influential magnates of the realm, along with less powerful nobles, more and more frequently grumbled about the Emperor. They complained that he had long since strayed from his initial stance of justice, love of peace, piety, fear of God, and various other duties. He had steadily been slipping into selfishness and neglect of duties, and soon he would be much worse than he used to be. Over time, Henry III's ideal of peace unleashed the harsh realities of justice, and as the legal system shifted from compensating the injured to punishing the guilty, this medieval autocrat developed an arbitrary reputation among the rich and poor alike. Though the last Ottonian emperor deposed almost as many vassals as Conrad II and Henry III combined, that was because the Salian command monarchy simply did not tolerate repeat offenders, invoking the ancient Roman precedent of laesae maestatis, injured majesty, Henry considered rebellion the highest form of treason, punishable by the immediate confiscation of all lands and titles. In rare cases, he even threatened to use the death penalty. Nor was Henry seen as an ally to the poor. A story invented shortly after his death tells of a sleeping traveler who dreamed about a peasant petitioning the emperor. Wait, you numbskull, Henry barked, until I find time to listen to you. The peasant held his ground. Oh, emperor. How could I possibly wait any longer when I've already used up all I ever owned to be here? The pauper's entreaty fell on deaf ears, and after two more peasants experienced much the same treatment, this unfortunate lot decided to petition God instead of his vicar. The divine reply came like a bolt from the blue and poof, the emperor was gone, just like that. After the traveler awoke, he continued on his merry way, hearing the news only a little while later. The Emperor was dead. Quite a different tale from the one told of Henry's father, Conrad II. It begs the question, were father and son really all that different? Or were they just living in different times? Either way, the nature of Henry's death was good fodder for any such stories about divine retribution. In 1056, the second Salian Emperor met his end after a feverish eight-day struggle digesting a stag's liver. His innards were then carted off for burial in the mining town of Gosler, and his body interred in the newly consecrated Cathedral of Speyer. The six-year-old Henry IV succeeded to a kingdom in turmoil. In the region of Saxony, formerly called the Emperor's Kitchen, the cauldron of descent bubbled fitfully. There was talk not only of deposing the child monarch, but assassinating him outright. Fortunately, there were still those in the realm who had the Salian family's best interests at heart, none more so than the German-born Pope, Victor II. The fact that Victor was a leading figure in the Gregorian reforms only adds to the irony, but for the time being, church and state still relied on one another. That would swiftly change with the Pope's death the following year. At that point, Henry's mother, Agnes, took the reins. Yet her uncompromising tendencies, along with her rumored affair, gradually alienated both the nobility and the church. 
Suffice it to say, Agnes was no Teofanu. And in 1062, the nobles seized power in the coup of Kaiserswerth. This was a total humiliation of the sacral monarchy, one duly recorded by that period's leading chronicler. One day, when the young king was cheerful after a festive meal, the Archbishop of Köln urged him to inspect a ship which had been splendidly decked out for this purpose. The unsuspecting boy was easily persuaded. Just before he set foot on the boat, however, he was surrounded by the Archbishop's hired accomplices. They hoisted the oars, started rowing with all their might, and steered the vessel as quick as lightning into the middle of the stream. The king, perplexed by the unexpected twist of events, had only one thought, that he would be murdered. In despair, he threw himself headlong into the river. In all likelihood, he would have drowned in the swift current if Count Eckbert of Brunswick had not jumped after him, disregarding the great danger to his own life. He barely rescued him from the treacherous waters and brought him back on board. The king now was consoled with calming words and brought to Köln. A large crowd followed the convoy along the bank of the river, and many alleged that the royal majesty had been violated and deprived of its self-determination. With Charlemagne's heir and regalia secured, the wily Archbishop of Köln became the leading man in Germany until Henry reached adulthood. That moment came with the king's 16th birthday, an occasion he made full use of by drawing steel against his former kidnapper, the Archbishop. To the relief of those in attendance, cooler heads prevailed, and Agnes was able to talk her son down. Now that Henry IV was at the tiller, he would have to navigate unfamiliar waters, charting a brave new world. He'd grown up on stories of distant lands only now emerging from darkness, an eastern matriarchy on the shores of the Baltic, where women conceived children with one immaculate sip of water, their boys born with canine heads attached to their chests, while their girls understandably remained maidens. Way out west, an island further even than the island of ice, where the people were the same shade of green as the sea that enveloped them. And within the very bosom of the Holy Roman Empire, there were also the signs of a new world. There were, for example, the German Ministeriales, a servile class of middle managers, not unlike the Italian Balbasores. Initially, these self-made serfs were bound in servitude to the church, but gradually more and more aligned with the state instead. By Henry IV's time, some Ministeriales even assumed positions of distinction at the royal court. Among their other duties, they played dice with the boy king and took a hand in educating him. It was a childhood affinity that would have important consequences. Further afield, there were the Normans, who gave their name to the northwestern protrusion of France that their Viking ancestors settled in. Theirs was perhaps the greatest success story of the 11th century. In 1066, the same year that Henry IV turned 16, Roughly 8,000 of them conquered England under William the Bastard, who outdid all the Viking invaders the preceding two centuries by founding a dynasty that lasted nearly a century. Just as impressive are the Normans that conquered all of southern Italy, from boot to ball. In doing so, they ended a 300-year battle royale between Franks, Germans, Greeks, Italians, Berbers, and Arabs. The Norman victory in this struggle was a gradual process that began at the turn of the millennium, when the first Normans came seeking a peninsular pit stop on their way to the Holy Land. By 1059, they came to the attention of the reformer Pope, Nicholas II, and eager to legitimize themselves, they exchanged military protection in return for papal recognition. This effectively overturned two and a half centuries of papal reliance on the Holy Roman Empire. That same year, Gregorian reformers attempted to harden the rules of papal elections, limiting participation to seven Roman cardinals or auxiliary bishops. No longer would patricians, commoners, or emperors so blatantly interfere in the choosing of a new pope, at least in theory. It was becoming clearer and clearer that the Gregorian reform movement aimed not only to purify the church, but to secure its liberty from an imperial overlord. What's more, Reformers meant for this liberty to extend not only to the choosing of popes, but also to bishops and archbishops, something Henry IV would soon become all too aware of. At the start of his reign, he still had other fish to fry. Determined to restore the Salian command monarchy to its former strength, 
The new king looked like he was built for such a role. When his corpse was exhumed alongside Conrad II's, it offered mute testimony to a swaggering and sturdy, six-foot-tall specimen of the Salian clan, one made in the image of his grandfather. And because his skeletal remains were so remarkably well-preserved, a facial reconstruction was attempted using a skull. Nor was Henry all brawn and no brains. He possessed great intellectual powers and insights, and when the princes wavered in their judgment concerning legal matters or an imperial policy, he himself swiftly untangled the knot and explained to them which approach was more just and useful, as if he were drawing from a secret well of wisdom. Attentively he listened to the voices around him while saying little himself. He did not burst out with his own opinion prematurely, but wanted to hear what others had to say. When his eyes looked piercingly into someone's face, he detected that man's innermost feelings and saw as if he were looking with the eyes of a lynx, whether this person bore hatred or love in his heart. It also seems praiseworthy to me that he was the tallest in the circle of princes. But Henry also had a dark side. His opponents accused him of being bloated with pride and doing whatever his heart desired. They said he was a cruel husband and womanizer who shared his mistresses with the ministeriales. Stories of his turbulent home life abounded. When Henry decided he'd had enough of his first wife, Bertha, he sent someone to seduce and compromise her, a surefire means of snagging a divorce. But the whole scheme backfired when Bertha found Henry at the scene of the crime, hiding in the background. She must have been quite a woman, because in her regal rage, it was said that the queen gave the king such a beating that he remained bedridden for the next month. Eventually, the royal couple reconciled, and Bertha accompanied Henry to Canossa before her death and burial in Speyer Cathedral. Yet Henry's second marriage to a Russian princess named Praxades was hardly less scandalous. After she started scheming against him, Henry had her thrown in prison, only for Praxades to escape and take refuge in Canossa of all places. There she accused him of participating in orgies, satanic rituals, and the whole nine yards. There's no doubt that these rumors were colored by Henry IV's struggles with both the nobility and the papacy, yet even his supporters had to admit that he could at times be ruthless. Whoever rose up against him and his authority willfully was so cruelly struck down that traces of his royal punishment are visible among the offender's descendants to this very day. Thus he preserved his own power as well as the future welfare of the realm for men should learn to abstain from disturbing the peace and from devastating the realm with armed violence. To Henry IV, the ends justified the means. He began his reign by transferring 12 royal monasteries to the discontented aristocracy, even as he built eight stone castles on the jagged outcrops of Saxony. It was classic carrot and stick, and these Hohenbergen, or high castles, were a steep departure from the wooden motts of the past leveraging cutting-edge building techniques, sustained economic growth, and the managerial expertise of the ministeriales. It was this class of up-and-comers who oversaw the construction and maintenance of the royal high castles, and one of these forts, the Harzberg, even functioned as a secondary salient burial site. In the eyes of his opponents, the king was effectively trying to reduce the Saxons and Thuringians into servitude. There's little wonder why they felt that way, if the reports were true about Ministerialis terrorizing Saxon villages. In 1073, the first Saxon revolt broke out, spearheaded by the Duke of Bavaria. Though the king and nobles were on the verge of a peace settlement the following year, this prospect immediately unraveled when Henry got the news that the Harzburg had been ransacked. After the recent indignities the monarchy had suffered, this was not something Henry could allow. And so, on the 9th of June, 1075, the two sides met near Langensauza, which gave its name to the biggest battle of the salient period. Royal forces may have numbered as many as 25,000 men, who advanced in five ranks against a smaller, less equipped force of rebels. Seizing the initiative, the royalist Duke of Swabia charged the rebel center, and the battle quickly turned into a rout and then a slaughter. Henry IV had been victorious and it seemed there was no one left to oppose him at the tiller. But just then, the ship of state was rocked by a furious south wind, a tempest known to history 
as Gregory VII. This force of nature was a long time in the coming, and in calmer waters was baptized Hildebrand, the son of a simple blacksmith. Entering the service of the church, he forged a new destiny for himself as a leading Gregorian reformer, and he had been the real power behind St. Peter's throne for quite a few years now. It was said that during the papacy of Nicholas II, Hildebrand fed him in the Lateran like a donkey in his stall. When it came time for Hildebrand himself to assume the papal throne, no election would be required. Instead, he was named Pope by acclamation, not unlike the way the ancients named their emperors. Ultimately, the fact that the Gregorian reforms are called what they are has as much to do with the seventh Gregory as the first. In his choice of papal name, this new master of Rome was reminding Europe of a time before the Salians, Atonians, and Carolingians, and also of a much more recent time, when the sixth Gregory was deposed by Henry's father. Yet the Pope acknowledged that the sins of the father are not the sins of the son, so at first he gave Henry IV a chance. Gregory gently chided him both for his politics and his rumored misbehavior. But by the close of 1075, the Bishop of the Eternal City of Rome adopted a rather different tone. Bishop Gregory, servant of the servants of God, sends King Henry greetings and apostolic blessings, provided that he obey the Pope as behooves a Christian king. You should show more respect to the head of the church. If you indeed belong to the Lord's ship, you are actually bound over to him through the word and power of the Lord. He will then lead you to pasture as Christ has commanded him. Peter, lead my sheep to pasture. Since we, as holder of his seat and his apostolic office, through God's will, represent his power, in reality it is he, Christ himself, who receives whatever communication, written or oral, you convey to us. Therefore, you should take care that your words and messages to us contain no willful disobedience, since you will not deny due reverence to us, but to God, the Almighty. This sudden escalation was occasioned by Henry's insistence on appointing the Bishop of Milan, a diocese where the reformist movement had deep roots. Already in the reign of Conrad II, Milan had been the center of imperial opposition during the Valvasores revolt. The controversial appointment of a Milanese bishop therefore presented the perfect opportunity for Gregory VII to make his stand. But Henry would not back down, and in the reply he issued at the start of 1076, he threatened the Pope with deposition. The ironic thing is that in this game of medieval brinkmanship, Henry was emboldened by bishops in favor of royal intervention, while Gregory was emboldened by nobles in favor of papal intervention. The simple fact of the matter is that neither the church nor the state was a monolith. Had the kings and nobles presented a unified front, Gregory would have had absolutely no leverage against Henry. In the event, the Pope combined good politics with sound morals, and took the unprecedented step of excommunicating the king in the form of a prayer to St. Peter. For your sake, St. Peter. I believe that God has granted me power to bind and absolve in heaven and on earth in this firm conviction for the glory and protection of your church in the name of God the Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. By force of your power and authority, I thus deprive King Henry, Emperor Henry's son, who rose up against your church with unprecedented arrogance of his regal lordship over Germany and Italy. And I absolve all Christians from the oath they have sworn to him or might swear to him in the future, and I deny him the honor of serving as king heretofore, and since he has spurned to obey as a Christian should, and has not returned to God, whom he has abandoned, I, as your deputy, strike him with the scourge of God's course. That was the final word on the matter. By the summer of 1076, Henry was an outcast in his own kingdom, and by the fall of that year, the nobles convened for an assembly, an effort to return to the old, consensual way of doing things. 
Since Henry refused to show, the nobles opted to present their errant king with an ultimatum, regain the Pope's favor or be deposed. It would have been a generous offer had it not been for such a tight deadline. Henry had until the one-year anniversary of the royal excommunication, February 1077. That left him with four months, give or take. Not much time at all in an age before telephones or telegraphs. Seen in this light, Henry's trip to Canossa can be appreciated for its speed and initiative, if nothing else. The Pope had refused to grant the king an audience in Rome, and only stopped in Canossa on his way to Augsburg, where yet another assembly was soon to take place. Though the Pope feared the king would come to Italy at the head of an army, which probably would have been the correct move, Henry chose the diplomatic option, factoring in the impressive fortifications around Canossa and the treacherous winter conditions of the Montseny Pass. Ironically, given how close he'd been to a divorce, Henry had his mother-in-law Adelaide to thank not only for providing safe passage through her lands in northern Italy, but also for her diplomatic intercession with Matilda of Canossa, her second cousin. Though Matilda was the king's vassal in name, her true loyalties lay with the Pope. Nevertheless, Adelaide, Matilda, and Henry's godfather, the reformer monk, Hugh of Cluny, all made entreaties to the Pope on the king's behalf. And despite all this legwork, when Henry finally arrived in Canossa on January 25th, 1077, Gregory held out on him, which is why the king took the unprecedented step of prostrating himself before the Pope. Humility was the last trump card a king or emperor had. Henry II begged his bishops to have the Diocese of Bamberg created, while Conrad II begged his son to part ways with an errant duke. Louis the Pious begged for penance twice for misconduct toward his family, and on more than one occasion, Otto III and Henry III publicly appeared in sackcloth. Like his predecessors, Henry IV was resorting to his last trump card. He knew that the image of a king kneeling before the Pope would be a powerful one but it's possible he underestimated exactly how powerful it would be. That brings us to the final stretch of the story, the trip back from Canossa. As it turns out, the German magnates went through with Henry's deposition anyway. Acting independently of the papacy, they elected the first ever anti-king, one Rudolf of Swabia, who had formerly kidnapped Henry's sister and forced her into marriage during the Regency period. Because Rudolf would draw much of his strength from that old cauldron of dissent, his election marked the start of the Second Saxon Uprising. After Henry returned to Germany, he was able to eke out enough support to fight several indecisive skirmishes against the rebels over the next three years. Things got ugly in the close of 1080, when Henry tried to join his forces with Bohemia, which supported the royal cause. In the marshland surrounding the Elster River, a tributary of the Saale, Henry's troops were routed, and he only escaped capture by fleeing to the Bohemian camp. Yet in a stunning reversal of fate, the battle turned out to be a pyrrhic victory for Henry because the anti-king Rudolf came out of it mortally wounded, and also with one hand missing. Because this had been Rudolf's Schwerhand, or swear hand, the one he used to pledge fealty to Henry, there could have been no more poetic form of royal justice. Though the rebellion would continue for another decade, Henry had enough wind in his sails by 1080 to settle some old scores. His entreaties to the Pope to have the anti-King Rudolf excommunicated had fallen on deaf ears, and Gregory instead decided to excommunicate Henry a second time. With Rudolf's death, the Pope must have realized that he had bet on the wrong horse, but he ultimately decided to double down. This allowed Henry to have Gregory deposed, his papacy's moral credibility undermined by the muck and mire of politics. Fast forward to 1084, and Henry had a hand-picked anti-pope formally grant him the imperial dignity. The following year, Gregory died in exile, having been rescued from the emperor's wrath by the Normans, who left Rome a scorching wreck. For all the missteps of his twilight years, Gregory VII fundamentally altered the dynamic between popes, kings, and emperors making the threat of a royal excommunication a thing to be feared. But at the time of his death, none of this was something he could know for certain, and so his epitaph was a somber one. I have loved justice and aided iniquity. Therefore, I die in exile. The embattled Henry IV would reign until 1105, presiding over the turn of another eschatologically anxious century. 
In the intervening period, he weathered continued opposition to his rule in Italy and Germany, culminating in the betrayal of his eldest son and heir, Conrad. Ultimately, Conrad died in Italian exile, having been unsuccessfully propped up by Matilda of Canossa and Pope Urban II. Named Pope by acclamation, Urban owed the emperor no loyalty and opposed him at every turn. In 1089, he even went so far as to broker a transalpine marriage alliance between the 43-year-old Matilda of Canossa and the 18-year-old Duke of Bavaria, a move that briefly trapped Henry in Italy. Even more pragmatic than his role model Gregory, Urban took the reforming spirit of the 11th century to its logical conclusion, adding a new weapon to the papal arsenal, the crusade. It was a fine demonstration of the idea that offense is the best defense, effectively turning the French and Normans into Rome's new protectors. No longer would popes be satisfied with merely wielding the spiritual sword. Now they would wield the temporal sword too, turning the Holy See of Rome into the undisputed leader of Christendom. Though Henry IV held on to power far longer than anyone expected, it obviously came at a cost, not only to the sacral monarchy, but to the reportedly suicidal monarch himself. Nor would the last year of Henry's life bring him any rest, for now he had to deal with the rebellion of his second son and namesake. For a moment, it seemed that the two would reconcile, but this turned out to be a ploy by the son against the father. A tearful Henry IV found himself on hands and knees, begging for his crown once again. Unlike the Pope, the prince was unrelenting and he kept his father in custody at Ingelheim. Not one to give up, Henry IV escaped from prison, and in the final drama of his life, he began mobilizing support wherever he could find it, only to die in Utrecht of natural causes. Though Henry V's betrayal was then referred to as the most heinous deed in all of German history, he was markedly kinder to his father in death, fighting tooth and nail against the church to have Henry IV's body interred in Speyer Cathedral. After the reign of this final salient dynast began in 1106, the chasm between church and state only widened. Like his father, Henry V was accused of being the Antichrist, though in his case, it was because he forcefully exacted an imperial coronation from Urban's successor, Pope Paschal II. In the twilight years of his reign, Henry V was backed into a corner in the struggle against the church, finally agreeing to the Concordat of Worms in 1122. This is the conclusion that the princes have reached regarding the controversies between the Lord Emperor and the realm. The Lord Emperor shall obey the Apostolic See. In regard to the damage that he has inflicted on the Church, the princes shall offer assistance and counsel in working out a compromise between him and the Lord Pope. And the peace that shall be concluded with the Pope must be firm and inviolable so that the Lord Emperor will obtain whatever belongs to him and the realm, and so that the church and everyone else will be able to enjoy his own peace and tranquility. This formally brought an end to the so-called investiture controversy, the name given to the long struggle beginning with Gregory VII and Henry IV. As we know by now, there was more to the story than the mere question of investing or appointing bishops. It was in fact a grueling battle for nothing less than total supremacy over Christendom, and it simultaneously marked the first moment that church and state emerged as distinct entities. Thanks as always for watching, and remember to leave a like and a comment if you enjoyed the video. You can check out today's sponsor, World of Warships, by visiting the video description or the pinned comment. Also feel free to join the channel Discord if you want to talk all things history. Thanks again, and I'll see you in the next one.